It was just shy of closing time at the Common Grounds Coffee Shack on February 1st, 2012. 18-year-old barista Samantha Koenig was busy cleaning up towards the end of her shift when her final customer of the night approached the kiosk window. Nothing about the man seemed initially threatening. He ordered an Americano and waited patiently while it was prepared. Not even the ski mask he wore, which might otherwise be a red flag, was out of place in the Alaskan winter. But this man was not here by chance, and he certainly wasn't here for coffee. He had carefully selected this location from a number of shops in the area, singling it out because snowdrifts had obscured the shack from view and because the employees worked alone. But to Samantha, he was just another customer. She had no idea that she was serving one of the most dangerous serial killers of the 21st century, Israel Keys. As Samantha handed him his drink, Keys pulled a 22 caliber pistol and demanded money. He wanted Samantha to believe this was a robbery so she wouldn't resist. But he wasn't here for money either. Keyes instructed Samantha to turn off the kiosk lights and to sit down on the floor. He then entered through the window and bound Samantha's hands with zip ties before leading her out through the back exit. But Samantha refused to go quietly. As the two made their way across Tudor Road, Israel was momentarily distracted by a camera he found lying on the ground. Samantha took advantage of the lapse and made a break for it, but was quickly overrun and tackled to the ground. Furious, Keyes pressed his gun to Samantha's ribs and swore he'd kill her if she tried anything like that again. The tragedy is that had Samantha waited just a couple more minutes, she likely would have escaped. Right across from Keyes' truck, a group of people were loitering in the parking lot. Had Samantha fought or called out at this critical point, she might very well be alive today. But the memory of the gun pressed to her side and Key's threat paralyzed her. She got into the truck without incident, and the two drove off into the night. From here, Keys took Samantha to a shed on his property, which he had set up as a makeshift kill site. Anticipating a victim, he had prepared the shed with tarps, cleaning supplies, and restraints. Here, he tied Samantha to the wall before sexually assaulting her repeatedly and eventually strangling her to death. He then locked Samantha's body inside of a cabinet and left on a cruise out of New Orleans with his 10-year-old daughter. When he returned to Alaska on February 18th, Keyes learned that Samantha's father, James Koenig, had appealed to the public and raised thousands of dollars to help bring his daughter home. A lifelong thief, Keyes couldn't resist this kind of money. And it's this greed that would ultimately lead to his capture. Keyes demanded $30,000 for Samantha's safe return, an outcome he, of course, knew was impossible. So, to convince the family and authorities that Samantha was still alive, he came up with a truly appalling plan. Samantha's body was frozen. It was 20 degrees in Anchorage at the time, so there were no noticeable signs of decomposition. He first thawed out the body using a hair dryer. To make her appear alive, he styled her hair and hid any discoloration under several layers of makeup. He then sewed her eyes open with fishing line and took photos of her with a recent issue of the Anchorage Daily Newspaper as proof of life. Next, he placed the picture along with a ransom note inside of a Ziploc bag and tacked it to a bulletin board in town underneath a flyer for a missing dog. Finally, Keys used Samantha's phone to text her boyfriend the note's location. When he was finished, he dismembered the body and spent the next few days dumping the pieces in Matanuska Lake. According to the note, 
Samantha's father was to deposit the money into Samantha's account. Once Keyes verified the funds, he would send another text with Samantha's location. He couldn't have known it at the time, but he had just sealed his own fate. By this point, Samantha had been missing three weeks, and the investigation into her disappearance wasn't going well. Anchorage police still thought it was possible that Samantha had vanished voluntarily, even after the discovery of the surveillance footage, which they didn't bother to request for nearly three weeks. More importantly, however, they had repeatedly rejected the FBI's offers to assist on the case. But now that Keyes had confirmed Samantha's disappearance to be a kidnapping, the FBI no longer needed APD's approval. This was their case. On February 29th, at the direction of the FBI, James Koenig deposited $5,000 into the account. All authorities could do now is watch the account and wait. They didn't have to wait long. Key's first attempt to access the money came only four hours later when he tried to withdraw $600 from an ATM in Anchorage. However, the transaction was declined due to a $500 daily withdrawal limit imposed by Samantha's bank. Keyes must have figured out the problem because two hours later, he successfully withdrew $500 from an ATM at the Denali Federal Credit Union, a location just a few miles from the first attempt. Over the next couple of hours, Keyes withdrew an additional $1,000 from separate ATMs across Anchorage, and then went dark. He didn't touch the account for more than a week. On March 6th, Keyes left Anchorage to attend his sister's wedding in Wells, Texas. Supposedly to save money, he caught a flight to Las Vegas and rented a white Ford Focus to drive the rest of the way. It was during this strange road trip that Keyes once again began using Samantha's card. He made four ATM withdrawals between the 7th and the 10th, totaling more than $1,000. The first was in Wilcox, Arizona. The next was a day later in Lordsburg, New Mexico. And the final two were in Shepherd and Humble, Texas, respectively. Keyes had been remarkably careful to this point. He used the card sporadically and made certain to cover his face when approaching ATMs. But despite his caution, it was in Shepard at the People's National Bank that he made the critical mistake. His rental car was captured on security footage. Soon after, a bolo was issued for a white male driving a white 2012 Ford Focus likely on or near US-59. Two days after this description was circulated, Texas State Trooper Brian Henry was heading for lunch when he spotted a white Ford Focus parked at a Holiday Inn in Lufkin. It fit the bolo, so Henry set up on 59 in view of the inn and waited. Not long after, a lone white male exited room 215 and got into the car. Now, Henry just needed an excuse to conduct a traffic stop. A few miles up the road, the driver gave him one when he exceeded the speed limit by two miles per hour. As Henry approached the car, he noticed a pair of white tennis shoes under the driver's seat and a roll of cash in the passenger side door. Henry was already suspicious, but when the man produced an Alaskan driver's license, he was convinced. This couldn't all be a coincidence. An exact match on the vehicle in the area investigators predicted. And now, the driver, Israel Keys, was from the same state as the victim. It was too much. And while Keys was polite and cooperative, he was also sweating profusely and volunteered a bit too much information. Experience told Henry he was hiding something. By this point, Texas Ranger Steve Rayburn 
and Agent Deborah Ganaway at the FBI had arrived on the scene. They agreed with Henry. This was the guy, but they had nothing substantial. And Key's cooperation stopped abruptly when they requested to search his vehicle. The officers were in a bind. If they searched the car and it was later ruled unlawful, nothing they discovered would be admissible in court. But if they let him go, Keyes would surely destroy any evidence the first chance he got. So, the options were either maybe lose the evidence eventually, or definitely lose it immediately. And at the time, investigators thought Samantha might still be alive. If she were, and they let Keyes go, she likely wouldn't be for long. Ultimately, they decided the risk of cutting him loose was too high and searched the vehicle. What they found was damning. Among the items recovered from the car were Samantha's debit card, ID, and cell phone. For someone who claimed not to know Samantha, Keys sure had a lot of her things. There was also a map with a highlighted route that coincided perfectly with the debit card trail and a mask that matched the one seen on surveillance footage. Not that either was necessary at this point. They had him. Keyes was immediately taken into custody and soon after was extradited back to Anchorage. Back in Alaska, investigators had two immediate questions. Where was Samantha Koenig? And who the hell was Israel Keys? They wouldn't like either answer. There is no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. They know they're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kind of things I'm telling you, is me. How long have you been two different people? (laughs) Long time. 14 years. Israel wasn't lying. Like many killers, he lived a double life. He had carefully constructed a persona to mask his darker impulses and he went to great efforts to keep his two lives separate. Investigators knew that if they wanted to learn about Israel Keys the monster, they first had to learn about Israel Keys the person. Keys was born in Richmond, Utah on January 7th, 1978. Coming from a large Mormon family, he lived a sheltered childhood. For religious reasons, his parents rejected public school and opted instead to homeschool Israel and his nine siblings. When Keyes was five, his family renounced Mormonism and moved to Washington, where they embraced the Christian identity movement, a radical, white supremacist sect of Christianity known for its overt anti-Semitic teachings. Keyes described their life here as Amish-like and militant. They lived in extreme poverty, with the entire family packed into a single room cabin without running water or electricity. It was here where Israel befriended the infamous Kehoe brothers, domestic terrorists whose five state crime spree would later end with the brutal murder of the Mueller family in Arkansas. The brothers inspired Israel's love of guns and taught him about the impending race war being planned by their father. By the age of 10, Israel knew he was different. He built pipe bombs and started fires for fun, frequently burglarized homes in the area, and could torture animals without remorse. Had his parents been less negligent, they might have noticed the signs of a budding psychopath. Despite the early indoctrination, religion never really stuck with keys. After a brief brush with Satanism in his late teens, he would eventually come to describe himself as an atheist. 
It says a lot about his family that the atheism, not the pipe bombs, got him kicked out of his home. With nowhere to go, Israel opted to sign up with the military. He joined the army in 1998, where he spent time in Fort Lewis, Fort Hood, and even a brief stint in Egypt. Friends in the service described him as something of a loner and a heavy drinker, but readily praised his job performance and work ethic. Clearly, the army agreed, as Keyes received a number of medals and decorations for his service, before being honorably discharged in 2001 at the rank of specialist. When he left the military, Keyes moved to Nia Bay, Washington, to be with the woman he met online. Not long after, he became a father. Here, Keyes worked as a repairman for the Maka tribe and was described as a valuable member of the community. The couple lived together for six years before Israel took their daughter and moved to Anchorage in 2007. In Anchorage, Keyes began dating another woman, opened a construction business, and generally seemed to live a model American life. He was well-liked by his neighbors, and his clients spoke highly of his work. When he was eventually arrested in connection with Samantha's kidnapping, the community was shocked. No one could believe that the Israel Keys they knew was capable of something so unthinkable. Now, investigators had to fill in the darker side of the story. And this meant peeling back the mask Keys had spent a lifetime constructing. They had to sit across the table from him and smile while he described the most heinous acts imaginable in an almost bored tone of voice. But Keyes required that a few conditions be met before he was willing to talk. First, he wanted the information he gave them to be withheld from the media. He didn't want his daughter seeing his crimes on the news or hearing about them at school. Next, he demanded to be guaranteed the death penalty within a year of telling his story. He knew his life was over and wanted to make it official. When Keyes finally began, he confirmed investigators' worst fears. Not only was Samantha dead, but she was only the tip of the iceberg. Keyes was a monster. He was smart, patient, and above all, dangerous. For more than a decade, he had committed crimes ranging from bank robbery, to arson, to murder, all without ever once appearing on police radar, much less getting caught. But what really makes Keyes so unusual is that he did these things in the digital age. Unlike Bundy, or BTK, Keyes committed his atrocities in a world with social media, high-definition video, and modern forensic science. This required discipline and a meticulous attention to detail. His victims were almost always chosen out of state and completely at random. He hid kill kits across the country usually buckets containing items such as guns, duct tape, rope, and Drano. He would bury these caches months, even years in advance, long before identifying a potential victim. This ability to delay gratification is what really set Keyes apart. Unlike most serial killers, he could, if not control his compulsion, at least manage it. He had the foresight and patience to hide these kill kits and allow them to sit untouched for long periods of time. And he made certain that when he chose a victim, there was no possible connection to him. Similar to his trip after murdering Samantha, Keyes would fly to one state, rent a car, and drive for hundreds of miles before selecting a target. 
This was exactly what he did when he murdered Bill and Lorraine Courier in 2011. He flew from his home in Alaska to Chicago and took a rental car a thousand miles to Burlington, Vermont. Here, he dug up a kill kit he had hidden more than two years prior. After carefully scouting the area, he decided on the Courier home for two primary reasons. The couple had a garage that allowed easy access to the home, and there were no children. Killing kids was the one line Keys refused to cross. He walked to the Courier home from his hotel around midnight. He cut the couple's phone line and then snuck in through the garage as planned. He went through the kitchen and slipped upstairs into the bedroom to find the couple sleeping. Bill and Lorraine woke with Keyes standing at the foot of their bed, holding a gun. Just like with Samantha, Keyes convinced them he was only there for money. He asked them where their debit cards were located, whether they had a safe, and about any other valuables in the home. After he robbed them, Keyes forced the couple into their own car and drove them to an abandoned farmhouse nearby. By this point, the couriers understood that this wasn't just a robbery. He took Bill inside first and tied him to a stool in the basement. But when he returned to the car, he discovered that Lorraine had escaped. He caught her before she got to the main road and dragged her by the hair into the house, where he tied her hands and feet to the upstairs bed. He intended to sexually assault her, but was interrupted by Bill's screams from the basement. Frustrated, Keyes went back downstairs and found that Bill had nearly broken free of his bonds. He was furious. This was the second time tonight one of his captives had nearly escaped. He flew into a blind rage and bludgeoned Bill repeatedly with a shovel before shooting him in the head. When he went back upstairs, Lorraine was hysterical. She had heard the gunshots and wanted to know if her husband was okay. Keyes responded by cutting her clothes off with a knife, sexually assaulting her, and then dragging her downstairs to see Bill's dead body. Only after she saw her husband beaten and lying in a pool of his own blood did Keyes finally strangle her to death. Before leaving the farmhouse, he dumped the courier's bodies in the basement and doused them with Drano to destroy any lingering physical evidence. Unfortunately, we'll never know the full extent of Israel Keyes' crimes. Because rather than admit to his atrocities, and provide closure to the families he destroyed. Keyes took the coward's route one final time. On December 1st, 2012, he snuck a razor into his cell and opened both of his wrists. His last act was to draw a series of 11 skulls in his own blood, which investigators believe represents his final tally of 11 victims. Now, this was going to be the part where I discussed Key's other suspected crimes. But anytime I talk about serial killers, I always ask myself whether they'd enjoy hearing the things I'm saying. Most of them are narcissists to their core and love hearing about their crimes, how brilliant they were, and how many lives they destroyed. They get off on it. But nothing about this video is meant to glorify Israel Keyes. He was a psychopath and a murderer who barely deserves our contempt, much less our admiration. The unfortunate reality is that shining a light on his atrocities necessarily means talking about him. There's no way around that. But we can remember that it's Key's victims who really matter. And not just the ones he killed, but the loved ones he left behind. Samantha Koenig, 
The couriers and other nameless victims of Israel Keys had friends and family who loved them dearly and who now have to go on without them. The real story of Israel Keys is one of a small, empty man with a God complex whose greatest achievement in life was his decision to stop living. And that's how he should be remembered. Thank you for watching this Fact and Suspicion presentation. If you enjoyed this style of content and would like to see more of it, please let us know by liking, subscribing, and maybe leaving a comment. We put a lot of effort into this project and would love any feedback you have to offer. Thanks from the Fact and Suspicion team.